Um, I must confess a couple of things. I just between you and an excellent performance and an excellent meal, so I'm trying to do as quickly as possible in order to allow you to enjoy what is coming next. That's one thing. Second thing is I need a little bit of clarification. I accepted this job when I was about to go on an expedition to climb Mount Everest. And as you're preparing an expedition to climb Mount Everest, and somebody says, would you do the red thread for the Human Globalization Summit in Zermatt? I said, well, that's easier than climbing Everest. So I did accept. Now that I've been here the full day, and I just came back from Everest, which we did summit a month ago, this is much harder. So, so <laughs> please bear with me the difficulties of trying to put this. Um, I've been helped by uh, Lovisa Lonengren. Are you there somewhere, Lovisa? Lovisa, thank you very much for helping me in this, in trying to collect what you all have heard and seen today. So I'm going to try and make it work. The slides are not for you to read, so forget it. It's just for me to remind uh, of some of the things you, that you've said, but I'll, I'll be using them. This is the introduction this morning, and Christopher gave us a, a sort of... Um, the reason why the um, human globalization was called the changing hearts and minds. And uh, he talked about the markets not being useful uh, to, the, to the challenge of um, humanization, globalization, that new kinds of leadership, entrepreneurship, and statementship was needed, and they're more important than profits. Uh, and you need that kind of leadership, and in the last session, uh, we talked about leadership in terms of maybe for Europe leadership, need to uh, develop a leadership that is for the community, the environment, the individual, thus developing the whole uh, communities. Um, so that's why he came out and saying that, I'm sorry, the open minds and hearts as the uh, main topic of this thing. And then the different members of that panel uh, Nicola Butetze about reviewing purpose. And I love the word that he used, purpose. In the corporate world, we tend to use goals, challenges. Uh, and he talked about a more profound word, which is called purpose, uh, which has meaning, which is deep. And I think he invited us to review that in order to include spirit, society, politics, and services. One clarification. I took from all what happened today what might be useful for us as individuals in doing tomorrow, the guys in this room. So I won't stop and uh, extend myself in the criticizing of markets. You all did. Or the problems we have with environmental challenges and the, and the race of, of temperatures and climate change. We all know that. So I didn't, I'm not going to use time in describing that. I'm, concentrating on things that we, as individuals, as members of different communities, might use. One of them is thinking about purpose. Your purpose is life, your purpose of your organization, your purpose of your government, your purpose of your local government, of whatever you are working with. Revise and review that purpose. Then, uh, the other Nicola made a very good definition of common good. And he said something that to me is very important. It is not a compromise between the individual and the collective is a definition in itself that has power in itself. It's not just how we meet at the middle. It's a, f a different way of looking at things. And he talked about uh, it is a set, of social co uh, it's a set of social conditions that allow fulfillment easily for individuals, for communities, for... And he talked about three different dimensions, if you remember, and he said about creation, social, and spiritual. Uh, we're going to get back to this because that's very important. Um, but then he said something which I value very much. Don't stay ourselves in theory. And I read the documents that Christopher had uh, mentioned. And the one on common good that Antonin wrote has to do that. You know, ha we have to work through theory into practice. And then came the famous Keynes statement, there is nothing more practical than a good idea. And I, we think that common good is a good idea, that we need to work with it. Um, the, an example for that, for example, if, if you think about common good and how it was defined, one example of the practicality of that definition is the, which to me is very important, is to raise the importance of intermediate associations within our community. 
the, the, even in Anton, Antonin's document, there is the individual and the big government or the common you know, benefits. Uh, in our countries in Latin America, for whatever reason, and I'm not going to go, we've destroyed all the intermediate layers of organization. So you have the individual and the big government. Uh, there is no, and especially in Chile from country, there is no intermediate. And if we want to seek for common governments and we take definitions afterwards, we need to find and build those intermediate organizations. So that is a practical consequence of the good idea of the common good definition that came in. Uh, and finally, which I loved also about the comment was, who's responsible for common good? We are, we all are as individuals, as members of intermediate organizations, as members of national governments, or as, as members of, in a global level as we are today. So we all have, we are responsible for common good. Sometimes when I hear, hear about that politics don't work, markets don't work, international relations don't work, the UN doesn't work, uh, so it's their fault, wait, 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 wait. It's our fault because we are members of all those levels of organization, the individual level, through family, through the intermediate, through the high uh, international level. So I think that was a very good start for the day, so stay tuned. Uh, that's my change and this is the other change. So then we had two panels. Uh, one was global governance for the universal common good and the second question that the panel just bef before that, um, before us, uh, Definition is there a common good? Uh, I'm not going to go through this. This is in your programs. That were the questions set to those that first panel: global governance for the universal common good, and that's it there. And I'm going to read it in order to make this fast. And all of this came out. Jacob, he was moderating the panel, and he said, "Common good is a government and public affair. Again, markets will not be able to address it properly. You know, we are to a certain extent." demonizing markets, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, we have to get involved in public life. That's a very practical consequence. We have to get in public, involved in public life. We need to move out from, especially business people, out from our own businesses and start working with, again, those intermediate organizations that are at different levels, part of the community at the local level, or even the government, or even bigger governments. That's why I, th I think that is very important. Um, bye, 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 that was a very good example about President Bush. Bye, bye, bye is not the answer. Environmental debts can be reshaped. I mentioned those as an examples of things that we could do, not just think or theorize about. And then came uh, our view from Asia, which I found very, very interesting. And I met with Manfred today, and even all of us keep on making mistakes. And I think we made a mistake when we keep on giving in and bringing in Western thought. And, you know, Chandra immediately said, look, there is not a single person or thinking or thought from Asia, from East, all right? And so we, I think we need to recover that. And he made a very good point on how we need to change the narrative of what, is, what prosperity is. Um, the Western economic model, again, markets and the free markets of consumption is simply not possible in the future. He related to the topic of purpose, redefine prosperity. What's the prosperity? What's the, the purpose of our societies? Uh, technology will not save us. Key issue is rise to access on resources. We need to focus on that. And he said the big example, if China and India, in India want to follow the American uh, way of development, we're done. Simply we're done. How do you address that? It's another issue. Then we have the ladies and new purposes that are more inclusive that need information, transformational changes in our ways to operate. Um, Example given, consider the uh, global ships. I think this is very important because it comes from somebody that work at the other end of the Glacier Express at Davos. You know, there, is a, there is a great Glacier Express that goes from Cermat to Davos. And uh, Davos has gone through, and the World Economic Forum has gone through an immense development and growth and changing of ideas since it first started. And when you hear people and persons working 
uh, at Davos and come with these personal beliefs and mindsets. What kind of values do we want for the future? Again, need to be refined. When somebody from when it started was sort of traditional economic, is thinking about that, I think uh, we've achieved something. I think, really. And I thank the, the, the Davos people for thinking that way. Uh, then we had proposals for new ways of financing governments, and I thought that was very interesting when uh, the idea was printing money, which for us who studied traditional economics in traditional business schools is always means of inflation, wait, 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 not necessarily. And I think that was a very good example of things that we can do, but we are prejudiced in doing. Huh? And so I thank you that for, that, for, that, for that comment. Um, review finance burdens and strengthen and build democratic institutions. Ms. Uh, Alain just made an incredible um, um, backing of what to build our democratic institutions and strengthen the UN. And I think this is interesting. We keep on hearing from the media that the UN and international organizations don't work. And I think your point and many points is we need to strengthen. We need to give them trust and to make them do their work, which is extremely, extremely complex. Uh, government has things to do for the common good uh, regarding those three dimensions that Nicola was saying at the beginning. In the social dimension was a very good example about inequality. There is a good example of what governments can do in terms of using the concept of common good. The creative dimension and addressing unemployment, very good examples, and the spiritual dimension, the religious freedom. So again, we were moving from a theoretical definition of common good to something practical. In this case, governments can do. And I think that was a very interesting uh, um, comment by, by Nicola. And again, at the end, this is something that it might be debatable. Uh, but I wanted to put it up, is the need for a universal, and I say body coordination or government that is not the gathering of sovereign states. And so this, to a certain extent, conflicts with the strengthening the UN in terms of the UN being a sum of sovereign states. We need some kind of world government. I know this is debatable, but that's the... the, the um, Thus, better coordinating the systems for peace and security, development and rule of law, and human rights principles. And I went to Nicola, and he specifically wrote those down because I haven't captured them. So, so that's exactly what he said. Uh, principles needed, though, are subsidiary, participation, and solidarity. Solidarity came again in the last speech we just heard from the official presentation. So that was some of the things that came out on the first panel, uh, and I'm going to go over it quickly on the second one. Is there a common good? Um, again, the, uh, it was moderated by Patrick Dixon. This might much be more in your memories because it just happened a few, maybe an hour ago. Uh, common good has to pass the barrier, again, of practicality. When I first came to the first summit of Zermatt three years ago, I had this debt, and we discussed this with Christopher and the people of the board, that we might be too theoretical. Well, it was our first summit. I think we need to pass the, the, this barrier, this challenge of practicality, how we turn what we think in common good into practical things. Uh, and then came um, Pierre Morel with in good words like international Darwinism. Uh, markets, again, are not capable of conducting common good. The complex international relations require the installation of trust. And again, this is, a, this is something we need to do, the installing trust. And to build reconciliation and mutualization, which I thought was a very nice word. Uh, seek an internal, international system to, my words, work out the world. You know, somebody to, again, this superior body or agreement that would help us work the, 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 our universal world, the common good, um, to solve world issues, and he mentioned water, access, security, health, etc. Uh, then came our cardinal who said, common good is a set of social conditions, and he came from the Catholic world and came back to that same definition or very similar to what Nicola has given us before. Uh, Common good is the set of social conditions for the fulfillment of human beings. And he reminded us that uh, the individual, the human being, is a very valuable thing, and, and we need to preserve that. 
and I think Patrick final comments I'm gonna go into that in a word in a minute uh, helps um, then uh, Ima from Spain made a very interesting comment she said every community defines its own common good at its time in history which I think is a very valuable thing in terms of practical reality you know it's totally different to build a community in the Sherpa land where I just came from, in Namche Vasar or in Kumjung or in, than we do it in Santiago. It's a totally different thing, you know? And I think that. But that doesn't uh, impede, she said, that there is no successive common good umbrellas, she said, and, and you go bigger and bigger common goods and to get to the final universal stage. But I think that's maybe a possible way of building this that you build common good in your local community and you gradually start moving up the ladder and you make it into a maybe universal set of common good. Uh, again, we've, we've, to me, we've demonized markets today and we'll also demonize governments. And I'm gonna get back to this in my very last slide in just one minute. Uh, but she said, look, we need to understand how governments operate. And she gave several reasons why it's very difficult for governments no, to follow the path of common good. And she gave very good reasons, that, and we all know about them. Uh, example of individual sacrifices to benefit the community, she, she, she gave in Spain today, and I was in Spain only a week ago, and I saw some of those examples. Uh, she demanded the need for integration between East and West. Again, if we go back to the point this morning, when we only put Westerner thoughts in our thinking of common good and not the Eastern, and so we need to integrate that and push for total transparency and accountability uh, and move to uh, give responsibility to the citizens, which I think are very important issues going from the universal to the individual. And finally, a very strong position by um, Patrick, who said the need for global leadership but the contrary he got from Pierre, that's very, very, very difficult. And I'm not sure we want to have a world president. Well, so we need to think about that. Uh, but then he said this strong words of tribalism and universalism working together and the value of them both. Um, so I think uh, those are very good. So this is my final comments on um, what might be a red thread. Evil market, okay, so what? We are not gonna erase the market system from the world tomorrow as we leave Zermatt. We're gonna have to lead with those markets for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So how do we do that? How do we work within those markets? It's not gonna be easy to tell China and India not to seek no United States style of development. So I don't think it's a useful path to just demonize markets. I don't think it's gonna help us building some road to common good. So we need to find a work, a way to work with them, around them, I don't know. But it's something that, it's not just enough to say markets won't solve the problems of the earth. That's fine, great statement, so what do we do? We cannot erase market systems from the world from in a night though. So, so and, I, and I tell you this in, in Latin America, we're small in terms of China and India, but Latin America is following that path again. So we need to, to find a way to work with them. That, so that's one thing. The same thing with evil governments. Uh, again, Ima described why the governments not necessarily push for the common good, because they need to confront everyday realities. So, demonizing governments, okay, that's fine, but we need to again start working, seeking ways and forms to work with them or to promote political changes that would change. For example, in my country, we have elections every four years with no re-election. So, <laughs> there is, the government is installed in two years and then the next two years he fights for being re-elected. So, what does that government do for common good? Very little. So we need to change the political system. But I can go, we cannot get rid of democratic systems in Chile. That's gonna take you know, gradual changes. So we need to, I, I think it's not enough to just demonize the problems we have. 
The third issue is the role of the individual. And I, and I, and I, um, my th red threads is three, this is the first, is it what we are gonna do. Not what Swiss government is gonna do, not what the municipality of Santiago is gonna do, not the tribal leaders of the Sherpa people in Kumjung are gonna do. It's what I'm gonna do. How I am gonna be changed by these three, three days and how I'm gonna think differently on how I approach. Let me go back to that game, X and Y. I think it made you guys individually think a lot of how you operate in the world and how you're gonna change your schemes of operating. Uh, and finally, this is my final comment because it's gonna open the, the discussion for tomorrow. Uh, Max brought this idea of aren't we throughout this day too human-centered? Well, it's called humanizing globalization. Uh, but aren't we leaving a space for other forms of life? in general, uh, and to me, the, to me personally, that's very important because I work myself and I live my life in nature, so I think that's a very good point. So that's the summary for today. Thank you very much for your patience.